All right, tonight we pick up in our study in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. And we're going to pick up officially in verse 5 tonight. I'm going to just make a couple comments about verse 4 that we talked about last week, which is a some good, uh, really good discussion. We won't go back over all that again. What I want to say about Cain and Abel, examples of faith, Abel, demonstrated faith, which for our purposes is believing in God, right? Believing in God, believing what God says to us. And uh, before I get into Abel's faith, you know, Old Testament, New Testament, a little different. They did have faith in the Old Testament, as I shared with you last week. Um, believing God, believing what he says. But in our case, under the New Covenant, New Testament Christians, we have a a different spiritual experience. We're born again of the Spirit, so our faith is at a at a higher level. Let's say it it goes to a different level in in the Spirit. Which what that should say to us, if there were so many miracles in the Old Testament that took place with the kind of faith that they had, the level of faith they had, and so I don't think we can begin to imagine what is possible today with the experience we have in the Lord, being born of the Spirit and the kind of faith that we can exercise in God. You know, in Ephesians, you know, tells us in chapter 3, you know, it kind of speaks to that. It says, now unto him who is able, God is able, to do exceedingly, abundantly which is you know just a whole bunch above right so not just exceedingly abundantly but above what we are uh, what we ask or can even think of to ask right and that amazing god can do so much more than what we can even imagine to ask him for and you know, what we do ask him for and not just a little bit but in, in an incalculable measure above all that in other words that's another way of saying nothing's impossible with god god can do all of that and he and he goes on to say there in ephesians chapter three that it according specifically he's referring to according to the power that works in us, the power that's in us already, the power of God in believers, not just what God is able to do apart from us, which is anything, of course, he wants to do, but based specifically in that context of the power that is within us through the Holy Spirit, through that power, God is, is able to do far 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 above what we, can, what we can even imagine to ask him for and of course that's through faith so that's that's what's available to us of course it has to be according to the will of god you know while as he purposes but we so underestimate what god can do we do and so i i i i'm one who believes that we receive from the Lord, all of us receive miracles and so forth, but what God would want to do in our lives is probably so much more than we have believed for. And if we could just believe him for more, then more of his blessings could be enacted in our lives. As far as Abel's faith, compared to Cain, of course they were brothers, Cain was the older one, and apparently indicates that Abel was one who was obedient to God, who understood that aspect of God created, you know, his, you know, Adam and Eve, you know, his mom and dad, and and he followed in that submission that they had early on to God. But Cain was the opposite and followed their example, unfortunately, in the fall, right? And going against God and being rebellious. And so it's kind of interesting, those two, the contrast in them. And we talked 
last week at, at length and about the sacrifice and so forth. And I, all I want to say before we leave Cain and Abel is, and we talked about the fact that the sacrifice Abel offered through faith was a blood sacrifice, and the one Cain offered was, of course, what was something he was familiar with, which is to bring the fruit of the ground and that. And both of those kind of offerings were given to God under the old covenant later when God brought it to God's people through Moses. And so regardless of this fact, if Cain had brought a blood sacrifice, if that was the sacrifice God wanted from him, and I said this at the end last week, it still wouldn't have mattered. God still wouldn't have accepted his sacrifice because of his attitude, because he was rebellious, because he did not have humility. He had pride. And that doesn't mix with faith. You know, I said this last week, I'll say it again. We cannot exercise faith in pride. Faith is in humility, submission to God, and recognizing that God is worthy of being worshipped of our prayer. God is greater than we are. Pride says that we are greater, we know better than God does, if we don't put that into words. And that's not faith. That's what pride says. So that doesn't mix with faith. Faith is submitting to God and believing in God and God's power and that he alone has that power and that we do not and he is the greater and we're the lesser and that we serve him and we glorify him and we want to honor him. And that's through humility. Even Jesus humbled himself. Philippians chapter 2 says that he humbled himself. Said that he was, of course, with God. He was equal to God because he was God. But he humbled himself even to the point of going to the cross. He submitted to the will of God. He humbled himself. He demonstrated humility to us, submitting to God's will. And so we have to do that. Pride doesn't allow us to do that. Pride comes before a fall. Pride was the initial sin. Satan had pride and those with him. And that's why he was rebellious against God, led a rebellion against God, and was cast down to the earth. And that was, so that leads to, to sin, you know, and humility, of course, is joined with faith, humbling ourselves and recognizing God's preeminence, God's worthiness, that he alone is the answer for us. And so our faith has to be like that. And so even today, people can be full of, ministers can be full of pride. How many know that? You can become as a minister, they're going to be full, come, become full. And some have, some do. And then you're operating in faith. You're operating in yourself. And that, of course, that can lead to, a, unless you get it straightened out, whether it's a minister or, or not, you know, any believer, that leads to a fall because God has to be above us in our own heart and minds. We have to humble ourselves before God all the time and exercise faith. All right, before we jump into verse 5, does anybody have any uh, thoughts on the story of Cain and Abel that you want to express before we move on to verse 5 and other examples of faith, a hero of faith? All right, here's another story. And, Bill, we may not get that far. I'm sorry, buddy. We may not get through Hebrews until we get to heaven. I'm not sure, but it's okay. It's going to be all right. But uh, here's another story, and that's the story of Enoch. And you're, I know you're all familiar with that story. And it says here, by it's by faith. So again, Enoch wasn't born again, but he had a relationship with God through by believing God, believing God's promise, believing in the existence of God, and so forth. Faith, Enoch was taken away by God so that he did not see death. And then these this phrase, and was not found 
because God had taken him. Or before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. God literally took him, body, soul, and spirit, out of this present realm into heaven. That's what he did. Right? Just like he did Elijah. Although in Elijah's case, you know, the symbolism there, Elijah was taken up in a chariot, a chariot of fire, a fiery chariot. And it doesn't tell us exactly how Enoch was taken. It just says, you know, he was here one day and then, and then he was gone. He was gone entirely. Not just his spirit, but totally and completely Enoch was taken away. And that was because he pleased God. He pleased God with his faith. Was he perfect? No. How many recognize tonight? No human being has ever been perfect except for Jesus Christ himself. But Enoch pleased God. He believed God. He obeyed God. And to such a degree, at such a level, that God was pleased with him. And God was so pleased with him that he took him on to heaven before he died. He didn't die. The normal, you know, he didn't have the normal death. And so, and that's a, you know, that that kind of blows your mind. So you won't find his body anywhere because it's not, it's not here. <laughs> it's not buried somewhere. So that's kind of interesting. Carol. Why do you um Enoch was just taken away, but Elijah or Elisha, whoever, what had this big fanfare with going away in a chariot. Well, we don't know how God took Enoch. I mean, it, it just seems to, I mean, if you just read the narrative, it seems like he just just took him. It's like boom, which God can do that. But with Elijah, there was a lot of symbolism. You know, and Elisha was with him, and it was important for Elisha to see him go up into heaven through the power of God, and for the mantle that Elijah wore, which was symbolic of his position as the as the chief prophet. He was the number one prophet in the land. There were other prophets. There was a school of prophets that it speaks of during that, at that, if you read that story. And so it was important. The symbolism was important. He was taken up in the, the chariot of fire, which symbolizes, of course, the presence of God, the fire. You know, a chariot was just something they were familiar with of moving from one location to another. You know, if God had just taken him then there wouldn't have been a story for Elisha, you know, to embrace. They wouldn't know if he was lost somewhere or not or what happened to him. But Elisha, who was to take over that position of being the chief prophet and took up the mantle that came down from the chariot because Elijah released it and he came down and, and Elisha took it up and he became the chief prophet. All that was important. That symbolism was important. And so that's why I believe God did it that way instead of just taking him. And it was important because Elisha goes back to the school of the young prophets who are studying to, to be prophets. And they wanted to know where Elijah was. He basically told them, and they didn't believe him. So they went out and searched for him, and they couldn't find him anywhere. But he had the mantle, right? And he had the story. And so they accepted that he was the chief prophet after that. Yes, Brenda. Um, Pastor, if we go back into Genesis, we we learn quite a bit about Enoch, 
and you were talking about them and their faith, you know, and, and what we have now. Right. But I look back at them and they had great faith. They had great trust in God. And it, it's right. just amazing to to look at at their walk with God and the things that happened. But but in Genesis, it says that Enoch walked with God. Mm -hmm. that he had a progressive relationship with him. Evidently, a very close relationship with God. Of course, oh, we know, I believe he'll be one of the two that uh, the two prophets during the tribulation in Revelation that we read about. I believe that Elijah and Enoch will be that too because they were translated. They never saw. So there was a purpose in God taking Enoch. Mm -hmm. but, but we learned that, that he had he had a walk with God. And, and it seems like from the scriptures that that started after he had Methuselah. And it says after he begot Methuselah, or Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah, 300 years, begot sons and daughters. And he lived 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, it says it again. And he was not, for God took him. He translated him. And, and then we read in Jude, uh, the 14th and 15th verses, that he was a preacher of righteousness. So mm -hmm. he was a, he was a man of God who walked by faith, and and his life had to be a testimony to those that were around him in that time. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, some of those Old Testament uh, people, especially the ones that are mentioned here in this chapter, you know, the kind of kind of belief in God they had, even though the only point I was making was we have a spiritual experience that's different. Yeah born again and so if all that was possible for them right. what is possible for us right. it's so much greater even and if that's the standard if that's the minimum what what is possible now i mean it's just it's just amazing and there's so much that god is able to do through his people now uh with the with the level of faith the type of faith the the um the way in which faith is given to us you know to take us to that place where you know nothing's impossible so you know and we god, have, then it god ordains it yeah we have the whole we have the whole book right. <laughs> and, and we know faith comes from the word hearing the word hearing it preached hearing it taught reading it, studying it, meditating on it. and and still we struggle. We get in these situations. We I was I was apprehensive about going for the stress test because I mean I got really sick from it last year. And uh, I I was saying, Lord, I need peace. I need peace about this. And it was the day before, which was yesterday, I think it was, uh I was thinking on some stuff and the Lord's just kind of uh, made me realize you know we know people we can trust maybe it's our parents it's it's a friend somebody we got confidence that they tell us they're going to do something we know they'll do it unless you know we're humans unless something really happens that they can't you really have confidence in them and i thought if we can do that with those here on this earth that's what we're to do with our heavenly father and he loves us he cares for us and he will keep his word but Amen. but we know that even sometimes with those we trust or family or parents or whatever uh, sometimes we have to wait on it and and we don't like that part of it <laughs> but but i think i think i've thought about this at the time i thought we'd make this thing hard you know, we talk about faith. We make some out of it that it's it's that word. We've heard so much different preaching on you know, different ideas, mm -hmm. and it's simple, simply to have faith in Him. And yet we struggle with that at times. When we struggle, that simply we're not trusting Him. We're just not. And of course, the enemy wants he wants to steal our faith because he comes steal, kill, and destroy. If he can get our faith. We're in trouble. Yeah. So I'm and, sorry. I didn't mean to talk so oh, no, that's good. That's great. That's why we're here, right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You did mention, you know, some 
some theologians do definitely believe that uh, what you mentioned that you know Elijah and Enoch will be the prophets who during the and during in the book of Revelation who come in and speak and they're killed and they come back to life and all that it doesn't say that but uh, that's certainly a, a theory I, I can see where that could be true because they didn't die the first time like like you do uh it may not be true but it it, it might be um and you know, i can i can see where people would think that's a strong possibility and uh it's just one of those interesting things in scripture i'm i'm fascinated by those kind of things too myself you know about uh different kind of things that you you can't really get your mind around you're not sure about like that when we talked about melchizedek that's an interesting discussion too that doesn't have anything to do with going to heaven but it's just an interesting, you know, because there's some room for speculation there. And 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 so in this case with Enoch and Elijah, you know. So yeah, Enoch definitely was a man that was close to God. You know, his and I would say my my thought would be probably his entire life. And he completed he completed what he needed to do, the purpose for being here on the earth. You know, none of us, you know, it speaks to that. You know, we can we can see that in Enoch and also Eli Elijah, you know, can see the rapture all of us are gonna experience, which I shared that idea of Sunday, you know, from First Thessalonians chapter four. And you know, we will be raptured. You can see that kind of symbolized with both of them. Enoch was just taken. He just he was here and then he wasn't. He was taken up into heaven. And so was Elijah. And you know, it's kind of like a foreshadowing of and maybe God intended it that way of us, you know, seeing that God we're here on the earth and when we complete and if we don't go that way, if we go by way of death, I think it's true that once we complete what God has for us our purpose then in god's mind going to heaven is a is a is a prize it's it's a it's a wonderful thing precious to the sight of the lord is the death of his saint and all of us want to go to heaven i'm not volunteering to go tonight but it's going to be a glorious thing when we go right i'm not going to you know i'm not volunteering to go tonight because i don't think God is finished with me yet, purpose-wise, and or with you that are here. But what I believe, and you don't have to agree, but I just really believe it. I, I believe that if we are walking according to God's will, if we're doing God's will, and we have trust in God, we have faith in God, we're living right with God, and and we're trusting Him. I don't think the enemy or anyone else can take us out until God's ready for us to go. I think. I think God's protection is upon us and he will preserve us until we complete what we need to do. And I quoted this Sunday, but, you know, Apostle Paul said, I have fought a good fight, right? I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. I have completed the journey. I've done what God wanted me to do. And now I'm going to go be with the Lord. And I think that's, I think God has a purpose for all of us, a reason to be here as we go through this life. And when that purpose is over, then he takes us. Now we can go prematurely through foolish decisions like Satan was trying to get Jesus to do. If you jump off of the top of a of the temple, you know, that's, you're going to end your life prematurely, right? So don't do that. Don't jump on. In our case, maybe we wouldn't climb up to, you know, the top of a temple. Don't don't walk in front of a car you know don't do dangerous things don't jump off of a cliff you know you're, you're not going to survive but you know if you take the proper precautions and you have faith in god and you and you're in his will so you're serving the purpose he has for your life and that's important if we go off and do something that's not in his will then maybe not but if we're in his will and he has a purpose for us to accomplish then I think we will fulfill that.
And so sometimes people are taken before we think they should go. But that doesn't mean it's it's before their time to go. So I think we can we can do it prematurely by our own actions. But I, I do believe God will protect us and God will keep us and preserve us when we're walking in his will and in faith with him. And so Enoch, I think, came to the point where he had fulfilled his purpose. He was close to God, you know, really tight with God uh, in a very close way. And God just went ahead and instead of him dying, God just took him to heaven. And he could have put him to sleep and allowed him to die, but he didn't do it that way. And there's probably purpose in that. And we don't know all of the purpose of that. Maybe so he could come back and be one of those prophets. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, as, as I said, uh, to symbolize the, what happens to all of us, we, God just takes us into his presence and, and all that. But God only knows that. But we do know that God just took him and he wasn't found because he wasn't here anymore, which is an interesting story. He did please God. All right, anybody want to jump in? And then it leads us to verse six, which is really important for us. And you know, it's important that we leave off with the last phrase in verse five, talking about Enoch, he pleased God through his faith. It doesn't say that Abel pleased God, but he did, even though it doesn't say that. And then it expands that thought to all, you know, you know, it's like the writer of Hebrews and some think it's the apostle Paul and others think it's someone, you know, maybe someone else unknown. I can't tell you, but whoever the writer was, makes this statement for all of us here's what we need to understand here's the concept that he's trying to get across but without faith it is impossible to please him we can't please god without faith it's impossible to please god without faith yeah. faith is the bond between us and and god the connection it's through faith that we find forgiveness it's through faith that we humble ourselves before god and we worship god and we submit to god and we reach out by faith and receive the benefits of what jesus has done for us on the cross if you don't have faith you can't please god you can't come into that relationship with god where you're pleasing him you remain in your sins you can't there's no way you can't so there's no way for anyone to do it through our own actions, our own deeds, our own righteousness. And all of us know people who are good people, basically, we would say, describe them that way, decent, treat other people well, but aren't saved. And it's sad for us to think, but we have to realize they're not gonna go to heaven either unless they get right with God because you can't please god without faith faith in jesus christ is the only way for every one of us because no one is good enough jesus said that there's none good but god no one is good but god god is good and if we don't have his goodness then we are not good enough maybe good by our humanity standards but not good enough we have to have the righteousness of God. And we can't have that except through faith in Jesus Christ and submitting ourselves and humbling ourselves. We can't come to God and when we come and accept Jesus Christ and say, God, here I am, and here's what I've done. I've done all these good deeds and I treat everyone well. I'm a good person and all that. And I just want us to get together and have a connection let's be friends you know that doesn't work right you can't make your case that way no every one of us every person no matter how esteemed we are by other people we have to come and humble ourselves and we have to have faith to believe 
that there's nothing we can do. There's no worthiness on our part. And we totally depend on Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Every single person has to do it that way. And that's how we please God with faith in Jesus Christ and then submitting, of course, to him in humility in order to, to do that. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So on another note, once we do come to the Lord and accept him by faith, we please him in that way. In order to continue pleasing God, we must continue in faith, right? We can't stop believing. Of course, I, a couple of weeks ago, I preached that, that message, don't stop believing, right? And so we can't. We have to continue in faith. And uh, no matter how long we are serving the Lord. All right. Without faith, it's impossible to please him for. And here's the essence of faith. This is, he breaks it down here for us. You know, what's he talking about? Faith. For he who comes to God. Please God, we're going to come to God, right? He who comes to God must believe that he is. That's the first thing. You can't please God. You can't really have faith in God if you don't believe there is a God, right? So you have to believe that there is a God. And you have to believe, it doesn't say it here, but if you believe in God in the right way, then you also believe that Jesus Christ came and died for your sins on the cross. And you have to believe it to the that that applies to you and you submit to that. So you must believe that he is. And secondly, the second part of it, you have to believe that he is. And then you also have to believe that he, God, is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's the essence, really, of coming to God. When we ask people to come and give their heart to the Lord, that's what we're asking them to do. Believe in God. Believe that Jesus came and died for your sin. And then you have to believe that he died for you. And that if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, that he will reward you, that he will bless you, that he will accept you. You have to believe that, that he died for you and that he will accept you if you believe in Jesus Christ. You have to believe Jesus died for my sins. And if I embrace that, if I accept that through faith, that he will receive me, not because of my worthiness, anything I've done or can do or will do, because of Jesus Christ. It's all based on, on him. And that God is... God rewards those who diligently, see now the word diligent is there, diligently seek him. So it has to be an ongoing effort on our part. We have to diligently seek him. That's what, see, so you can't come to God initially with just a very casual, lukewarm, really don't care if he accepts me or not attitude. You have to really desire to be saved you have to really want god to accept you and you can't do it just because somebody in your family or a friend or someone pressuring you and urging you so i'll just do i'll just go through the motions and make them happy no you have to really want to be saved and so you have to diligently seek him and that doesn't apply just to initially when we accept the Lord as our Savior, but as we walk with him on this journey to heaven, we have to continue to seek him. Have faith in God and continue to seek God earnestly and continuously. You include him in everything. Don't hold back anything. All right, anybody, comments or questions? Yes. This is my take on. Um, I, I think the greatest reward is knowing him, being in his presence, and then throughout all eternity, there's no greater joy. No greater joy. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And that's the, that's the essential element. The, all the rest is just bonus. I mean, yeah. you really summed it up. You know, what we're really seeking, you know, all the other is 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 great to, to know that what God has for us, that, you know, heaven's going to be our home and, you know, and a dwelling place, a mansion, it's called in some versions, and all that that goes with that. But at the very heart of it, the very root of it, the, essentially what we're seeking is God. We're seeking to know him. That is it. I mean, that's the priority. That's the number one thing. That's if that's not if that's not at the heart of it, then then we're not we're missing the whole point and we don't actually have faith. Faith is I need a relationship with God. And I need for him to forgive me. I need to come before him, let's come to God, and and that's that's the great that's the essential joy right there as brenda said that's the at the very heart of it the joy that is beyond all other joy must be at the must be the basis for the rest of it is knowing him coming to know him if there wasn't anything else that has to be that has to be at the center of it and that that's motivation enough to come to him just to know him and and then all the others i mentioned is great and amazing that God blesses us with all these other blessings that are, are connected with knowing him because he loves us and he, he has plans for us. He has, you know, good things for us that also come with it. But the main thing, the only essential thing is knowing him. Anybody else? Anybody? All right, then we get into the story of Noah, of course, and the ark and all that. And it says, by faith, Noah divinely warned of things not yet seen, which is the essential element of what faith is, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. He believed God. God spoke to him. He was one who followed God too. He wasn't perfect. I mean, after all this he did some things and it was not perfect but he did believe god god spoke to him and commanded him to prepare the ark and all that said it was gonna it was gonna rain and he told him it was gonna be such a, a great and it hadn't rained before that on the earth the, the water just came up out of the ground and watered everything that's amazing right that would have been amazing but you know, God said, you know, I'm going to pour it out of heaven and it's going to be so much that, you know, the whole world's going to be flooded. You need a, you need a boat, man. You need, a, you need to be able to save yourself. And of course, we know the animals need to be saved. And so, you know, you could save some of them and, uh, and all that. And God spoke to him and told him exactly how to build it, what to do. And, he believed God. He had godly fear. He had a reverence for God. He had a respect for God. He had a humility. So we're back to humility. He didn't have pride. So I don't know. God doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, I don't believe that. He believed God. He humbled himself and did what God told him to do. And this was, this was, it took about a hundred years to, to do it. And People were laughing at him and making fun of him and his family the whole time, just on and on and on. And thought he was ridiculous. And the warning he gave them that destruction was coming and there was a flood coming. They, 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 you know what they would have said? That, that's never happened. You don't, you know, that's crazy. You are a crazy man. But he was undeterred and went ahead. 
And so he had he had faith. He had a type of faith. He believed God. God spoke to him. He believed him, submitted to that, had godly fear, went ahead and did what God instructed him to do. And also, of course, saved the animals as well, all the species that God had him to save. And uh, it was quite quite a story. So that's why he's in this uh this town. And he also convinced his family too to support him in that and and to be a part as well. Okay, anybody on that before we uh, wrap it up tonight? We can come back to it next week if you wish. Anybody? No? All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for uh, being a part of our study tonight, sharing with us. And uh, we never know, you know, who's going to be on, who isn't. But um, glad you could be on tonight. Good group, and uh, it might be the next week we'll have some other people as well. We'll see. It might be that next week we'll be in heaven for a study. Don't you think that you're going to get out of it just because we're in heaven? No, we're going we're to meet in a corner somewhere and continue until we finish the Hebrews. Or, or at least 11, right? All right. Like Bill uh, sent out, everybody, don't forget to uh, move your clocks forward. And I'll send out another another message, try to, on Saturday uh, for everybody. to. And I think everybody will hear about it on the news and all that. But uh, you don't want to miss out because in this case, in the spring, if you don't move your clock forward, you'll you'll be late. For church, so we're not we don't mind so much in the fall because they got an extra. If they show up early, it's okay. But <laughs> we don't want people showing up late. So anyway, gonna show up late anyway. Uh oh, did I say that? I said that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so everybody, have a blessed rest of your week. See you on uh, see you on Sunday. Hope to see you then. Okay. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.